Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ron, for that kind and gracious introduction. It's a pleasure, really. It's my pleasure to be here at the Francis Asbury Society. Um, there are giants uh, connected with this society uh, uh, whom I deeply respect. Um, uh, people like Dennis Kinlaw, Al Coppedge, uh, who both have functioned as kind of mentors for me, uh, people that I look up to uh, when I think about Wesley studies and, and what should be done. So I'm, I'm very grateful to be here. And of course, the late Harold Burgess, uh, who was a, a dear friend to me, uh, supported me, encouraged me when, when I was down, uh, when I was in low spirits. Um, knew how to do that ministry wonderfully, and uh, I'll, I'll always appreciate uh, his kindness, his love, and his care. Um, let's pray. <coughs> we give you thanks, Heavenly Father, for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. We are so grateful and thankful uh, to be called by his name and to be marked by his Spirit that you own us and you put your impress upon us, you mark us uh, as your children, whereby we cry uh, in the spirit, Abba, Father. We pray for the Francis Asbury Society and its ministry um, as it brings forward a precious tradition, our, our Wesleyan heritage, uh, which is a saving balm uh, to uh, those both near and far. We pray for the society. May they be strengthened, uh, uh, indefatigable in their labors uh, to reach the lost, the confused, uh, and those who hunger uh, for a savior. We're grateful also for the Wesleyan tradition, for those who have gone on before us, uh, for John Wesley and Charles Wesley and Susanna and others um, who have helped to mediate your grace um, and to proclaim the gospel forthrightly. Uh, freedom from the guilt of sin, freedom from its power or dominion, freedom from its very being. Uh, your hand is outstretched. You have a mighty arm. You are a great God, a wonderful deliverer. You set the captives free. Uh, and by the gift of your spirit, you make us holy. For all these things, we are grateful. We lift you up on the prayers of the saints. We adore you. We worship you. There is not a name greater than the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, and we celebrate him. We glorify uh, his holy name, that he loved us enough um, to go to the cross uh, and to suffer uh, the despising and the shame, um, knowing uh, that he would unite us with you, Holy Father. And we're grateful for the Redeemer, the Savior, the vine, the resurrection and the life, the door. And in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. By the power of the Holy Spirit, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. <coughs> okay, um, I think uh, Ron Smith has aptly designated this, this lecture. Uh, he came up with the title. Uh, and, and I think very, very apropos. Uh, John Wesley at 30,000 30, feet. Um, we are going to take the helicopter view. We're going to go up high and look at things from a Wesleyan perspective. Look at Wesley's theology from its most general, its most basic way. Uh, we're not going to take so much the footpath view. Uh, scholars love to do that. They love to get in little nooks and crannies, and sometimes they get in cul-de-sacs, and they can't figure out how to get out again. We're not going to do that uh, this morning. We're going to speak uh, in a very general way. Uh, I'm also grateful for Ron Smith. Uh, I've had the uh, opportunity to meet him and come to know him more closely through his participation in the Wesleyan Studies Summer Seminar. And, and I realized what a great uh, expanse of knowledge he has, especially in terms of Francis Asbury. Uh, and he enlivened the seminar uh, in, in all sorts of ways. And so. Uh, I wanted to express uh, appreciation for uh, his support also uh, for the seminar, the Wesleyan Studies Summer Seminar. Okay, um, we raised the question here, 
was Wesley a systematic theologian? Now, you probably have heard this, this question before, uh, to be sure. Um, and according to Albert Outler, Wesley was no theological titan, uh, no system builder. And Outler liked to refer to John Wesley as a folk theologian, uh, someone who did theology for the people, someone who was concerned uh, with the warp and woof of life. Okay? Um, and Outler, theologian, historian that he was, uh, he said that outside the Methodist tradition, Wesley is not really taken that very seriously, and that, that disturbed him. Uh, and he indicated perhaps the reason for it is that Wesley founded no uh, distinct school. He was not a theologian's theologian. Okay? So uh, if we have in mind by systematic theology, that, that Wesley is going to take some grand principle uh, and work it through uh, the doctrine of creation all the way to eschatology, much like Paul Tillich worked his method of correlation through all of his theology. The method of correlation being uh, life itself raises the questions, in other words, the human existential condition in terms of guilt, in terms of meaning, in terms of death, our own finitude, Christianity is the response or is the answer to that question posed by the, our existential condition itself. Well, if you read Paul Tillich, I mean, he works that method of correlation, uh, question response throughout his entire theology. Or if you take a look at Emil Bruner uh, and his works, uh, he understands truth as encounter. He develops this notion of uh, divine human correspondence, I thou, and he gets that from Buber, Martin Buber, the uh, Jewish uh, theologian. And whether you're reading the doctrine of God or the Trinity or the atonement, uh, Bruner is, is revolving back to this issue of divine human correspondence. If that's your understanding of what a systematic theologian is, uh, someone who is going to integrate all knowledge um, around a central principle, you may be disappointed uh, in John Wesley. You may be disappointed in John Wesley because that was not uh, the task that he set for himself. Now, if we look at some of Wesley's 18th century language, uh, he did not talk about theology. He talked about various kinds of divinity, various kinds of divinity. And so... He mentioned practical divinity, speculative divinity, controversial, positive, comparative, mystic, and even plain old Bible divinity uh, uh, to articulate the full range of his theological reflections. Um, at times, Wesley used the terms experimental and practical. He used those interchangeably, used those interchangeably. Um, Wesley was concerned about doing theology in the service of the church. That theology is for service. It's other directed. It is to serve the church, uh, to enable the church in her mission uh, to reach uh, a lost world. Uh, and so for Wesley, uh, practical divinity, and, and I think that would be the right term to describe Wesley's theology, practical divinity, among those divinities we've talked about, although Wesley does mix it up a little every now and then, and gets in controversial divinity, especially with the Calvinists uh, after, uh, uh, well, 1770 and even before, but pretty much focused on practical divinity. In other words, uh, the cash value of living the Christian life in the, in, in the warp and woof of life, um, the task of discipleship, the task of being restored practically um, in the image uh, and likeness of God. And so for Wesley, practical divinity is participatory and engaging. It's not a head game. Uh, it's something that requires a response of our entire person, body, mind, and soul, our entire person. It's engaging. And it entails nothing less than the actualization and verification of the truths of Scripture. Wesley believed that we live out the truth of Scripture in our lives. Uh, we prove also the truth of Scripture in the church by being the church, by being the body of Christ. Um, 
And so Christians for Wesley test the truth of Scripture for themselves within the church. And so the key term here uh, is practical divinity. With this focus, and this is a more narrow focus than theology on the grand scale, like a Moltmann or, or, a, 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 or an Emil Brunner, but with this more, um, w with this focus, Wesley had become a specialist in the doctrines of sin and salvation, whereby he took very seriously what we call the cure of souls or the care of souls. I'm amazed uh, um, at what a good uh, spiritual counselor Wesley was. Not, not early on. He gave some bad advice early on, but he improved over time. Uh, and I'm just amazed. Uh, the more I work in Wesley, the more I read Wesley, what a careful and balanced pastoral theologian he is, uh, giving proper advice how to go deeper into God, how to go deeper into holiness, what might bar the way. Uh, what might be the obstacles. Uh, he gets better at this uh, in the days ahead. Wesley's Practical Divinity, uh, Theology and Service of the Church with respect to our mission, uh, is a viable way of doing theology. It's a viable way of doing theology. Um, some theologians who are very philosophical and speculative may look down upon this, uh, but this way of doing theology certainly has its place uh, in, in the church. Um, this raises the question for us then, and I think this is an important question. This is not just a formal issue, but we need to talk about the style of Wesley's theology. Um, and Outler uh, was the first one to actually raise this issue uh, in arguing that Wesley, and you, you're getting a sense of something of Wesley's balance, that Outler says his theology is a third alternative, that Wesley's theology avoids extremes. Uh, it avoids the extreme on the one hand of Pelagian optimism uh, and then Augustinian pessimism. Uh, it rejects both of those as, as extremes. And um, so in terms of the style of Wesley's theology, in a sense he's a good Anglican. Uh, the Anglican tradition had prided itself on being a via media neither Rome nor Geneva. Uh, there, there's a kind of tension that goes on in the Anglican tradition. In a sense, Anglicanism is both Catholic and Reformed. Uh, in the same way, I, I think Wesley, his theology represents uh, a, a very important balance, a very important balance and, and synthesis, where a number of traditions are in play. That's the important point to see in terms of Wesley's style a number of theological traditions are streaming into his theological reflections. As you realize, Wesley is a very widely read person. Uh, he read broadly in terms of divinity uh, and theology. Now, some have privileged one particular tradition in their reading of Wesley's theology. Calvinism for George Corcel early on in the 20th century. Lutheran pietism for Franz Hildebrandt. Puritanism for Rupp, and the Eastern Fathers uh, for Maddox. The style of Wesley's theology, Wesley was, and this language goes back to Albert Outler, though I push it, I push this language in ways that Outler never did. Uh, Wesley was a conjunctive theologian, and, and I think that's a good designation of Wesley's theology. And I think it's also a good designation of where my view fits in in the number of Wesley scholars who are out there today. I am arguing a view that is conjunctive, both and, not either or, both and. Um, and that Wesley privileged no one theological tradition, perhaps with the exception of Anglicanism. I, I, would, I would say that, that if Wesley is privileging one theological tradition, it may be Anglicanism. But even in doing that, Anglicanism itself represents a via media, a conjunction. And so th there's no problem here. Um, his doctrine of salvation was marked by a number of careful balances and conjunctions. This is why Wesley's so powerful uh, as a pastoral counselor, because his advice is, is so weighty, it, it's so important. It represents 
the wisdom, the genius, really, of the universal church. Um, and we see an example of these conjunctions uh, in terms of it's faith alone and holy living. Faith alone and holy living. Where does faith alone come from? What, what venue of the church is that coming from? The Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, the Anglican Reformation. Holy living, where is this coming from? Well, it's coming from another sor a number of sources. Catholic, pietist. Uh, Wesley has these together, holding them together. Law and gospel, law and gospel. Um, I read some theologies of John Wesley out there, and everything is grace, grace, grace. They, they forget about the law. They forget about the moral law. The moral law is such an important part of Wesley's theology. It's one half of the conjunction. We don't understand grace aright unless we understand the context in which grace operates. The moral law, which is a copy of the divine mind, the face of God as we are able to bear it, the fitness of relations, Wesley writes. Without that context, grace is misunderstood as indulgence, that God indulges me in my ongoing sin. And Wesley would have none of it. That's antinomianism. Okay? And the moral law will easily catch that. That grace has to be understood in terms of law, the moral law. There's a normative context. There is the express will of God that has to be reckoned with. Not our will, but the divine will. Uh, favor and empowerment. Grace as both favor and empowerment. Grace as the forgiveness of sins. I talk about, in terms of Wesley's theology, the three great liberties of the gospel. And Francis Asbury Society celebrates every one of them. First, freedom from the guilt of sin in terms of justification by faith. Christ died for our sins. His blood has cleansed our consciences. We can look up and not be in fear or shame, but cry, Abba, Father. Our consciences are clear. We are the children of God. Christ died for us. We are forgiven. That's an important part. Um, but not simply favor. Empowerment. And our tradition has stressed that that the gospel is about liberation. It's not simply words, as Paul says, but it's the power, the power of God unto salvation. Not polishing chains, but breaking chains. Because Jesus Christ is a real redeemer. He's a real redeemer. He sets the captives free. Wesley knew that. Wesley knew that, and Wesley proclaimed that. Many churches out there today, they preach the favor of God, but they're balking at the power of God, as if God's hand is tied, as if God can't do. Tell people on Sunday morning that Christ loves you, that Christ died for your sins, that your sins are forgiven, and leave it at that. And that's not good news. That is not good news. Because without the regeneration of our nature, by the power of the Holy Spirit in us, we would be committing, again, almost the very same sins for which we just asked forgiveness in the first place. The God who is merciful enough to forgive us our sins is good enough to transform our nature, to set us free, to set us free. And Wesley expressed it this way. We are free from the power and dominion of sin in terms of the new birth. Not simply favor, but also empowerment we are empowered by the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives and heart to live the life towards which we are called. Justification and sanctification, both are important. Forgiveness of sins and becoming holy. Um, the universality of grace, in terms of provenient grace, and its limited saving actualization. Wesley was not a universalist, despite what some people are saying out there now. He was not. There, there is loss. There is separation from Christ, regrettably so. Um, divine initiative and human response, as well as initial and final justification. All right. Even though Wesley wasn't a systematic theologian, he did have an axial theme 
around which he revolved repeatedly. He came back to this again and again and again. For Outler, grace itself is the axial theme of Wesley's theology, the focus of all his thinking. You already know why I'm not happy with that answer. Tell comfortable, middle-class audiences that God loves them and they'll hardly thank you for the trouble. Of course God loves me, comes the reply. You see, but they're misunderstanding the gospel. They're misunderstanding the cost of Calvary, the seriousness of sin. It's corrupting power. They're missing that. You see. And, and uh, I'm thinking some of the conversations that are going on right now in my course, my EXL course, my online course with Wesley, um, they don't see the seriousness of sin. They, they've come from other traditions. They, they're not from the Wesleyan tradition. They, they think one sin is just like another, and they're not disturbed. And, and I have come back at them, and I said, beware, as Wesley knew, beware of the deceitfulness of sin. Sin does not leave us where we are at. It changes us. It stupefies. It corrupts. Do not presume upon the grace of God, but today is the day of repentance. Today. Today is the day of repentance because sin is that serious. It's that serious. And Wesley, Wesley knew that. Law and grace. Because if you don't have law and grace, you end up with cheap grace. You end up with cheap grace. Maddox argues responsible grace is the chief orienting concern. I'll have more to say about that in a few moments. Uh, again, you understand why I'm not happy with that answer. It, it's not simply grace. It, it's law and grace. I would argue um, that it, what best epitomizes Wesley's theology at this level, if we want the, the largest picture here, if we had to summarize it in the fewest words possible, I would say simply holiness and grace. First of all, I want the conjunction. I want the conjunction. Because if you don't have a conjunction, you don't have Wesley's theology. You have some flat-footed reading that's privileging some particular tradition, whether it's the Eastern Fathers, whether it's the Reformation, etc. So there's going to be a conjunction here. Holiness and grace. Okay? Uh, I think this is the major tension in Wesley's theology, what he's ever coming back to. Holiness and grace. Look at it this way. Okay, you see it up on the chart here, this is the major conjunction, holiness and grace. And in terms of each element of the conjunction, it's a part of another conjunction. Another conjunction makes it up. So when Wesley is writing about holiness in his writings, and he does so, as you might imagine, quite often, what he means by that holiness is holy love. The tension of holy love. And holy love is a tension. There's a tension here. Uh, and Wesley talked about this as well. Holiness, holiness is separating, distinct, peculiar. You know, we shall be a peculiar people. We're different. We're not just like the world. We're different. We're marked by graces that the world does not know. We have the Holy Spirit that the world does not know. We're different, removed, set apart. Love is outgoing, seeking communion. So you have this tension here, holy love, purity for the sake of communion, outgoingness. Um, and I think this tension of holy love is also emblematic of the church. I think Wesley's on to something here. The church is called out, ecclesia, is called out from the world to be a distinct people, to be the body of Christ, to be a healing bomb in the world. Uh, it's called to be distinct, but it's called to mission in the church. Now, what we've done in the 20th century and in, into the 21st century, we have so stressed the importance of mission, mission to the world, we have forgotten that we are a distinct people, that we're holy, uh, and that it's, in, it's important to be marked by the Redeemer as we go into mission. All right, and then in terms of grace, there's a conjunction here w as well. Not simply cooperant grace. There are a lot of readings of Wesley out there, and I think they're flat-footed. They're unconjunctive. 
they read Wesley simply in terms of one of his principal sermons on working out our own salvation. God works, therefore you can work. God works, therefore you must work. Is that a part of Wesley? Yes, absolutely. Does that explain all of Wesley? No, not by a long shot. That is a, ca a quote, quote, Catholic, cooperant, synergistic understanding of grace. It's part of what Wesley has, not the whole thing. Wesley also has an understanding of grace in terms of free grace. And he's getting this from the Reformation. The Reformation is streaming into his thinking. Uh, free grace, the work of God alone, sheer, utter gift. Think about it. Only God, only God can justify us. Only God can forgive us our sins. That's not a human work. That's not a human possibility. That is something we must receive. Receive. Wesley talks about extending the hand. To receive what? The gift. In terms of new birth, in terms of the transformation of nature, whereby we become holy? Not simply a little more of what already was. See, that's how synergism understands it. This is not a change of degree. It's not a little more of what already was. It's something new, that we're holy, because the Spirit is now in us. We've been washed. We've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's a qualitative difference. Uh, and it's not a human possibility. And when Wesley describes that, which is one of the two foci of the Wesleyan Ordo Salutis, he says it's by grace through faith. By grace through faith. Again, the Reformation is coming through. This is a gift to be received. The new birth, as with entire sanctification, is a gift uh, to, be, to be received. Okay? So we see uh, these conjunctions, these tensions uh, in, in Wesley's theology. Uh, Wesley, in a letter to John Smith in 1745, observes, God would first, by this inspiration of his, of his spirit, have wrought in our hearts that holy love without which none can enter into glory. Moreover, Wesley notes uh, that this law is none other than the law of love, the holy love of God and neighbor. Well, I've been known to mix it up with some of the contemporary Wesleyan theologians out there. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you why I do so. I'll, I'll tell this audience why I do so. I do so because I believe the conversation is important. And I believe we need to talk about uh, larger and broader issues. And one of those conversations that I'm having right now is with Thomas Ord and Michael Lodal, who are Nazarene theologians. And they argue that holiness equals love. And as a matter of fact, uh, Thomas Ord posted on a website, no holy love in John Wesley. This is when I was coming back from Estonia and I'm getting off the plane and I'm, I'm seeing that this is what's been posted, no holy love in John Wesley. Uh, and I immediately uh, got out, consulted my resources and posted to the delight of, of Heitzenrader, by the way, 12 specific places where Wesley affirms holy love. That holy love is really what this is all about. Uh, this, that's, this is what it's all about. The holy love of God manifested in Christ Jesus our Lord, transforming us uh, in that image. Um, they don't like Wesley's definition of holiness. I mean, I've had this conversation. Wesley's very careful. He's very specific in defining holiness. He says holiness two things. Simplicity, simplicity. Those who've studied Aquinas will understand that very clearly, what the simplicity of God entails in terms of holiness, and purity. Simplicity and purity are those two attributes or traits of, uh, of holiness. And so for Wesley, holiness as simplicity and purity informs God's love and sets it apart from all other loves. See, I think we need that descriptor in terms of love. Because even in the church, if we talk about love, given our context in a, in a, in a large society like North American liberal democracies, people are going to misunderstand what we mean by love. And we're not talking about any kind of love here. We're talking about the love manifested at Golgotha, at a cross. That's the kind of love that we're talking about. Okay? And so I really do think we need the tension here. Uh, holy love, not just love, it does not communicate. Holiness is holy love, avoids the error of theological liberalism in which love is equated with self-will, 
the will of preferred political groups, or with sentimentality, you see? Uh, sort of like as C.S. Lewis describing the liberalism of his own day, at the end of the day, people would say a, a good day was had by all. Uh, sort of thing, this kind of uh, sentimentality, not uh, coping uh, in an honest and forthright way with sin and grace. Uh, the error of some holiness teachers, on the other hand, have, they have understood holiness apart from love and therefore at times in a dour, legalistic, or unloving way. And so we need the love component there in terms of this. All right, underneath holiness and grace, there is another conjunction, that is law and grace. Uh, Wesley criticized the gospel preachers, the quote gospel preachers who proclaim the grace of God in an unbalanced way, in an unbalanced way. And then, as I've indicated earlier, uh, for Wesley, grace is normed grace because the moral law expresses what is the will uh, of God. All right, grace is the other half of the conjunction, to be sure. Um, so we're speaking not simply about holiness, but we're talking about grace as well. And, and now I'm going to put up a, a, a slide which will show you, in, in a very focused way, the summation of Wesley's theology in terms of uh, the various conjunctions that he has in play. Um, and it is here. We have on the left-hand column, free grace coming from the Anglican Reformation, coming from German pietism, coming from Moravian Lutheranism, the voice of Luther coming through the Moravian community, all represented in uh, free grace here. And then cooperant grace, cooperant grace, okay? Um, you probably realize uh, what's been happening in Wesley's studies of late. They are simply talking about one side of the conjunction. What side are they talking about? Cooperant grace, cooperant grace. Uh, the, the reading of Wesley in terms of the Eastern Fathers, Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, and, and all of that. Uh, now, that's, that's important. Wesley certainly had the Eastern Fathers as a resource, uh, to be sure. Um, but that's only a part of his theology. We'd also have to look at what he gets from the Reformation. Um, and so we see a number of conjunctions here. Uh, uh, the first part here, uh, stressing the work of God alone. The second in terms of divine and human cooperation. Let's just go through these uh, rather, rather quickly here. This first conjunction, the work of God alone and synergism. Be attentive to this distinction. Synergists, those who simply have a Catholic understanding of grace, say, We've got all the bases covered. We've got a role for God, a role for humanity. We're done. And they'll say, God begins first. The initiative is always with God. And they think in saying that, they've got the entirety of Wesley's theology. They don't. Because they don't realize that divine human cooperation, even with the emphasis on divine initiative, is only one half of Wesley's understanding of grace because Wesley is also understanding grace as the work of God alone. Listen to what Wesley says for the person on the way to entire sanctification. This might shock you. If you think, this is an exact quote, if you think you must be or do something else first, see, you must be or do something else first, then you're expecting it by works, even unto this day. But if it is by the grace of God, the free grace of God, expect it as you are, and expect it when? Now. Expect it now. Why? Because it's a gift. A gift to be received by grace through faith. That Wesley had this immense understanding of the giftedness of salvation, of the graciousness of a God of holy love, of the mercy of a God of holy love. Uh, that God does things what we cannot do for ourselves and bestows uh, as a sheer utter gift. And so not only did Wesley view grace as cooperant, as reflected, for example, in his sermon on working out our own salvation, but he also viewed it in a very conjunctive way in terms of free grace. Okay? And here's this quote. God does not in any wise depend, 
Grace, excuse me, Wesley writes, does not in any wise depend either on the good works or righteousness of the receiver, not on anything he has done or anything he is. And then Wesley also wrote, we allow it as the work of God alone to justify, to sanctify, and to glorify which three comprehend the whole of salvation. This also must be brought into Wesley's understanding uh, of, of grace. You know, Wesley said uh, he, his theology comes within a hair's breadth of Calvinism, uh, and that's true. Uh, it, it, it doesn't go all the way. Uh, if it went all the way, it would be deterministic. Wesley's not deterministic. We'll talk about that in a few moments. But he is uh, within a hair's breadth of Calvinism because he is stressing the graciousness of redemption, the giftedness, uh, the importance of receiving what, in a real sense, is the work of God alone. Um, and then there is this issue of favor and empowerment, which we've been talking about, the undeserved favor of God being, uh, being manifested towards us, uh, the bounty, the favor of God, and then also uh, the enabling presence of the Holy Spirit. So not simply favor, but power as well. And then this is uh, an, another important tension, which is, forgotten in synergistic readings of Wesley, where you're simply stressing cooperant grace, okay? Because if you're talking about responding, if you're talking about responsible grace or responding, if you're talking about responding, you're talking about human work. Responding is something we do. And, and that certainly has an important place in Wesley's theology. It certainly does. Responding. But there must be a receiving. That's the step that's missed. It's the step of free grace. There must be a receiving before there is a responding. Older folk in our tradition used to talk about tarrying, waiting upon the Lord. Wesley understood that. Waiting upon God. Receiving what only God can do and have that flood into the life by grace through faith, the power of the gospel. The church is so rich in treasures because of who our God is, who God has been revealed to us in Jesus Christ. And God is richly merciful and empowering, not simply responding, but receiving first with the conjunction of both a Catholic synergistic paradigm and a Protestant one, we have the proper balance here. Believers must first receive before they can respond. This receiving, extending the hand to receive the gift, is not really a human work at all, but it is an openness, an openness. Almost, and watch my language here, I'm very careful, hair's breadth of Calvinism, almost in a passive sense. It is not passive. If it were passive, then it would be Calvinism and it would be determinism. Here's the issue we're dealing with. You may think this is a little technical point, but it, it has implications all over the place, okay, in terms of this issue. For Wesley and his theology, human beings are in the image and likeness of God. They are genuine vows, uh, so to speak. God does not run roughshod over us in any deterministic way. God will not force these gifts upon us. Justification, regeneration, we must receive them. We must extend the hand. See, now the synergists say, oh, well, there it is. There, there's a human work. You're, you're extending the hand. This is, this is synergism. No, no. This is, this is where I want to make the distinction. Yes, we are extending the hand. It's almost passive. This is really about God. It's not about us. It's about God and what God, how God wants to gift us in Jesus Christ uh, with forgiveness, with a transformation of nature at its highest levels in entire sanctification as well. So yes, there is the extending the hand. What does the extending the hand represent? What does it symbolize? The integrity of personhood, which I think gets washed out in Calvinism. The integrity of being a person and having a measure of freedom, a measure of freedom 
that has been restored by grace whereby we can receive from God or we can reject. We can reject justifying, regenerating grace. We can reject that. Um, and so um, this is a, a, a very uh, in, important uh, point. Believers must receive first before they can respond. And we receive almost in a passive sense. Um, some people, they just don't even like this because we're caught up in so much activist Christianity. What we do, what we do. Uh, Wesley was interested in what God does and what only God can do. And it's wonderful what God can do. Um, the instantaneous process. Oh, if there's one area of Wesley's theology that has been butchered, it's this area. By theologians from the top all the way down to people sitting in the pews. This has been butchered. Our tradition has been distorted in terms of this whole issue. Um, that temporal dimensions in Wesley's theology do not simply function chronologically. See, that's how it's read. And, and there's so much animus out there in terms of revivalism. You know, they say, oh, I, I can't have anything to do with the jump and stir of revivalism. Come to the altar now. Uh, you know, this kind of thing. Oh, God works in gradual ways, processive ways. Uh, the entire Christian life is a conversion. Well, you're misunderstanding what Wesley meant by the instantaneous. Because this is Wesley's favored way to celebrate, and that's the right word, celebrate the activity of God. Remember that quote I cited earlier? If you think you must be or do something else first, then you are expecting it by works. See, there's that grace works tension. You're expecting it by works even unto this day. But if it is by the grace of God, expect it as you are, expect it now. The nowness glorifies God. It says, only you can do this work. It is a sheer, utter gift, therefore, to be received now. It is, has to be understood soteriologically. It's Wesley's favorite way of highlighting the divine role, and he got that from the Reformation. He got that from the Anglican Reformation. Uh, the critics out there read everything in, in terms of 19th century revivalism, the jump and stir, um, and I think in a confused sort of way, because they miss this. They miss how this language is functioning uh, for, for Wesley. Look at it this way, in terms of these temporal dimensions. Process, crisis. See, some people, they don't like that word crisis. I, I'm quite comfortable with it. I think Wesley was too. Because process, crisis, is a window on another conjunction. And what is that? Possibility, reality. We may be many things in God's grace, but what are we today? See, that's the question Wesley's ever asking. Has grace been actualized? Has grace been realized in your life? Not simply what graces are possible, but what graces have been realized. So the process crisis tension gets at that, because the process crisis tension is a window on possibility, actualization. What are we really today? Are we living in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? To what we have been called. Again, this language, which has been greatly misunderstood by Wesley scholars, functions soteriologically for Wesley. He highlights God, he praises God for the giftedness uh, of redemption. Again, in terms of the issue of process instantaneous, and by this token may you surely know whether you seek it by faith or by works. If by works you want something to be done first, expect it now. So broadly understood, sanctification is characterized by both process. There, there's your Catholic paradigm. Wesley has that. He certainly has process. See, after a child is born of God, after a child is justified and forgiven, uh, they are going to grow in degrees of holiness until they are entirely sanctified. Okay? Um, I hear people make the confusion. They say entire sanctification is, is a process. Tells me right away they don't understand Wesley when they say entire sanctification is a process. Look at it this way. 
there are three major movements here. The new birth, instantaneous. Otherwise, it hasn't been realized. It hasn't been actualized. It, instantaneous. What's the image that Wesley uses to describe the new birth? A baby in its mother's womb. A baby in its mother's womb. Gestation, nine months, the baby's in the mother's womb. It's not all process, though. There comes a point, and it is a point, that baby is born. And there's a kind of wholeness to that word, that when that baby is born, there's a sense where it can't be anymore born. It's born. That's a threshold change. That's a threshold change. In the same way, there is repentance, convincing grace. There's process, but it's not all process. Because if it's all process, it ha grace hasn't been realized. It hasn't been actualized. The punctiliar is important here. Are you born of God or no? Have you been, have you, do you know Jesus Christ th this way or no? Do you know God this way or no, that you have been set free? You see? That, that's the question to ask here. All right, after a child is justified and born of God, there certainly is process. We are growing. We're learning. What is the will of God in the circumstances of life? We're growing by degree. We're becoming increasingly holy. God is transforming our loves, our dispositions and tempers, Wesley will say. That's the process of sanctification. And that's correct. Sanctification is a process. But entire sanctification is not a process. Entire sanctification is an actualized, realized grace of God. It either happened or it hasn't. You can't fudge it. Um, there are things that lead up to it, but it itself, crisis language is helpful here, very helpful. What's the image that Wesley used in, to describe entire sanctification? Just as he used the image in terms of the new birth, he used the image of birth for new birth. What did he use for entire sanctification? Someone just said it? Yes. Dying is a process for most people. It's a, it's a process. It's not all process. There comes a point. One dies. And you know what? That's a qualitative change. That's not a change of degree. Entire sanctification is not a change of degree. That's how the synergism, the synergistic paradigm wants to read it. it, it it's just another change in degree in holiness. And it's the last one. And, and, and we become entirely sanctified. No. Entire sanctification is a qualitative difference. Prior to entire sanctification, there was impurity of the heart, the carnal nature, inbred sin. Now the heart is pure. All the tempers and dispositions are rightly oriented towards God. Okay? Um, and so once again, this, this, if it's going to be realized, it has to have a first moment. Otherwise, it remains a possibility. It's just a possibility. Uh, and so Wesley's going to underscore the importance of having a first moment. Okay. Uh, George Croft Sell made the claim early in the 20th century uh, that Wesley's theology represents a unique synthesis of the Protestant ethic of grace with the Catholic ethic of holiness. Um, I think you can see why I differ from that reading, uh, because I think Wesley's understanding of grace embraced both Protestant and Catholic elements, both processive elements and elements that are going to stress actualization, realization, instantiation. Okay? And uh, uh, so I, I differ from that view. Two errors to be avoided in terms of original sin, free and cooperative grace and holiness, theological liberalism, neglected one and three, and misunderstood free grace as indulgence. Uh, uh, the second major error here, uh, some current Wesley scholars neglect free grace. As a matter of fact, there, there's no mention of it in their works, though it's, it's clearly in Wesley, in their desire to bring their theology under an overarching synergistic cooperant paradigm. That's not John Wesley. It's, it's not conjunctive. Wesley has more on the table. Um, it's a matter of both and. It's not a matter of either or. Uh, it's a matter of both and. So, to summarize... Uh, you can see why I'm so impressed uh, with the theology of John Wesley and, uh, and why I told you at the beginning he is uh, an adept pastoral counselor because he's ever holding a number of things in tension. He doesn't give one-sided answers. We live in an either-or world that needs to uh, hear the conjunctions of Wesley, so to speak. So, 
What questions or comments do you have in light of anything that we've, we've said here? Uh, yes? Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with Maddox so far as cooperant synergistic grace is very much a part of Wesley's theology. I just don't think it's the whole thing. Um, he hasn't uh, really uh, stressed the importance uh, of the Reformation, of free grace in his reading of Wesley. And I would say that I can trot out the evidence, very significant evidence in Wesley's writings where he is attentive to this. And so that would be my basic disagreement with Randy Maddox. It would be in terms of um, not having the proper conjunction in place. Not simply cooperant grace, but also it's the conjunction of cooperant and free grace that is most descriptive uh, of, of Wesley. But also Maddox um, wrote a book early on, uh, actually an edited book, Aldersgate Reconsidered. See, he put in the crosshairs conversion. And, and in a response to that, I put together a book, uh, Conversion in the Wesleyan Tradition, which was published by Abington. Um, uh, I think the conversion is important. Uh, I, I think we can't simply talk about the entirety of the Christian life as a conversion. Um, so that would be another difference. Um, um, he has you know, not stressed the importance of of conversion, uh, and I think that's integral to our tradition. I really do. Um, yeah, so those would be, I think, the, the major differences. I'm trying to be fair. I mean, I'm just trying to be descriptively, descriptively accurate. Those would be the major. Uh, uh, but Randy Maddox and I share this. We both want to see the Methodist Wesleyan tradition continue in through the 21st century. Whereas I'm not sure all the voices out there are in favor of that. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Other questions? Yes. Um, you can get at that by looking at his writings and how he uses grace in different contexts. And I think what you're going to find is that he stresses grace as the favor of God, and he stresses grace also as empowerment. Um, and then, of course, we can distinguish the various kinds of graces by uh, going through the auto salutis, uh, from uh, prevenient grace on to glorifying grace, glorifying grace, um, and, and the various stages along the way, so to speak. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Other questions, comments? Uh, yes? Yes. Yep, my mind field light went off too as you were speaking, and I and it said proceed with caution. <laughs> and uh, but I, I, here's I've thought about this uh, as you might imagine, and I think um, on the one hand, when Phoebe Palmer is stressing the availability of God's grace now, I is that in Wesley? The answer is yes, of course, it's there. So if you're, if you're quibbling with that, I'm not saying you, Ron, but I mean, if, if someone's quibbling with that, if they're quibbling with the nowness of it, and you already understand how that functions soteriologically, then I think your problem is not with Phoebe Palmer, it's with John Wesley. 
But I do think, here's where I'm going to get myself into trouble. Uh, now everyone's listening. Look at that. Okay. Um, I, I do think Phoebe Palmer didn't have the kind of conjunctive balance that Wesley had in his theology, in this sense, that though Wesley stressed the instantaneous uh, grace available now uh, in terms of the new birth and entire sanctification, he also, as, as a good pastoral um, theologian, recognized that for many people, and even the Methodist Conference recognized this, it would not be until just prior to death that their hearts were entirely sanctified. Uh, so Wesley's got the processive and all that's happening in the processive. He also has the crisis. Is the grace available today? The answer is yes. Yes, it is. And, and Phoebe Palmer is right in that. It is available today. It, we can enter in today. Um, will the overwhelming majority of the church be entirely sanctified uh, soon? And the answer is no. Uh, and then, so you have to raise the issue, uh, what bars the way? What's the problem here? And I've wrestled with this. I've looked at Wesley very carefully on this matter. And it seems to be that fear bars the way for, for many people. Um, that they're, they're, they're not ready, almost, to receive this gift uh, until they are prepared by the focusing that comes uh, through confronting their own finite condition. Um, you know, I, I've talked about this in my uh, book, The Theology of John Wesley, and, and I see they're up over there. You notice how I snuck that in? Uh, <laughs> but, um, um, yeah, so I think Phoebe Palmer, uh, as much as I like some of the things she's doing, I, I like Wesley better. That's my answer. I like Wesley better than Phoebe Palmer because I think Wesley uh, holds together uh, more things in tension than Phoebe Palmer is holding together. So uh, I am a kind of back to Wesley uh, kind of guy. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. The shorter, the middle, and the longer? No, I haven't, but it sounds interesting just with the title. That's right. And, and I think it is among Christians who are justified and born of God, it is always appropriate to preach entire sanctification uh, because that may be the day when some will enter in. They can receive the promise, uh, receive the promise and be transformed uh, and believe and enter in. Uh, so I think it's always appropriate. I would therefore criticize uh, that school of theology out there that uh, has taken issue with the whole instantaneous nowness dimension of entire sanctification as wrong. No, it's not wrong. It's correct. It's correct when you think about it in terms of the tension possibility, actuality. It's correct in terms of the distinction what we can do and what only God can do. Only God. Only God can make a soul entirely holy. That is a divine work. That is a divine work received by grace through faith. Yeah. Okay. Yes, the sacraments, are, of course, are important. Um, for Wesley, uh, assuming one is baptized, it's principally going to be, it's just going to be the Lord's Supper. And, of course, you're familiar with his sermon, The Duty of Constant Communion. Wesley... Uh, view the Lord's Supper as the means by which the grace of God can be communicated. So he viewed the Lord's Supper as a means of grace. grace of general, uh, uh, well, well, all sorts of graces 
can be mediated through the Lord's Supper. And, and there's, a, of course, a whole discussion on this issue. Uh, can justifying and regenerating graces be mediated through the Lord's Supper? And uh, I think the answer for Wesley is yes, that the, the Lord's Supper can be a converting ordinance in that respect, in that sense. Um, so Wesley would view the, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper uh, as, as very important and, and should be practiced frequently in the church because uh, it is the means by which, it's the channel by which God communicates grace to us uh, uh, in terms of justification and regeneration, that sort of thing, for being in grace, ongoing grace, yes. But he doesn't have um, a sacerdotal, what I would call a sacerdotal understanding of the Lord's Supper, which would be very Catholic. He doesn't have that understanding. Um, it, he sees it principally as a means of grace, an important means of grace. Um, yes. Other questions, comments? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. Wesley's, that's right, Wesley's counsel for someone who, let's say, is not even born of God yet, doesn't know this kind of freedom and liberty, is to be in the means of grace, all the means of grace. Read the Bible, pray, go to church, hear preaching, good preaching, uh, fast, be a part of Christian conference. Yes, the, they will be the means through which this grace can be communicated. Yes, yes. And... Um, that's that's important. How about two or three recommended reasons? Well, of course, I'm going to recommend the theology of John Wesley, <laughs> holy love, and the shape of grace. And, and would you have any of those here? Yeah, <laughs> gee. And I would also recommend a basic biography of John Wesley uh, called "A Real Christian." Do you want to be a real Christian as opposed to a nominal Christian? That's Wesley's own language. That was his burden throughout his entire life. Uh, that's over there too. I'd recommend uh, that uh, as well. Uh, so, and, but I recommend also uh, Wesley's um, sermons. And I haven't announced this publicly yet, but I'm going to say it, reveal it to you. What what I'm working on right now, that's coming down the pike. So you'll be the first one to know. Um, putting out a new edition of Wesley's sermons. It's going to be published by Abington Press. I've asked Jason Vickers of United Theological Seminary to help me with this. Uh, here's what we're doing. It's unlike the Heights and Raider volume, which is the anthology, because the anthology doesn't reach out to the British tradition, which had the 44 sermons, the North American Canadian tradition, which would be the how many sermons? The 52, or sometimes 53 sermons, the 52 standard sermons. And um, I, I, I thought that was problematic, that we need to have those sermons. To those 52, I've added eight more, eight more to fill it out. You know free grace is in the mix. You know the duty of constant communion is in the mix now. Uh, the danger of riches is in the mix. And it's all arranged according to the auto salutis. We begin with the sermon the image of God, and we end with the new creation. And every step along the way. In other words, this is for people, practical divinity, people who are reading Wesley's sermons, who are grappling, struggling with their own spiritual growth and want to go deeper into the graces of God. I am writing an introduction to each piece, uh, and Jason is writing an outline to each piece. Uh, we're going to publish this. It will be available in the fall of 2013. Uh, we think this is going to serve the church. We think this is going to help the Methodist tradition, the Wesleyan tradition in the 21st century. This is a book that's going to be used, that people are going to live with this, and they're, and they're going to celebrate our tradition. Why do we celebrate our tradition? Because it mediates to us the graces of Jesus Christ so beautifully. 
so efficaciously. That's why I, I am excited about Methodism and Wesleyanism because this is such a precious heritage whereby we can bring the healing savior to people who are hurting, who are beaten down and uh, need to know the love of God and the forgiveness of sins and, and the community of love, which is transformative. So keep it under your hats. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And uh, some of these sermons were never preached. Wesley is using sermon as a form of literature uh, in order to communicate in a very accessible way the truths of the Christian faith so that people will be empowered, they'll be illuminated, uh, they'll have clarity. What's the next step? What's the way forward? Uh, that sort of thing. So yes, sermons, um, treatises, letters, journals, there, there are a whole bunch of things here um, that would serve that purpose. Yes, that's, that's very... Uh, that, that tells us one more thing about yeah. what Wesley does with theology. He doesn't write a systematic theology textbook. Yeah. That is a good <laughs> That's right, that's right. Um, you know, Wesley's sermons have different effects on different people. Let me tell you a story. Um, I know a divinity student. She picked up Wesley's 52 standard sermons. She read them, and she said, why, these sermons, they judge me. They judge my life, my current experience right now. So she took those sermons, and she put them aside and never looked at them again. I know another person who read those 52 standard sermons and said, yeah, they judge me. <laughs> There's no way that I have received these kinds of graces. But this person, quite the contrary, was happy. Why was he happy? Because he saw the promise that would be fulfilled by God's grace. He saw that. And that made all the difference. What one saw simply as standard or demand the other one saw as promise to be realized by the grace of God, by the efficacious presence of the Holy Spirit that God will give to the children of God. You see? So, yeah. Yes, lots of Yes, I, I, I hear what you're saying, and... Wesley is more of a theologian like Luther uh, in terms of the occasional pieces in service of the church than he would be like Calvin writing the, the full systematic. So I think when you point to someone like a Watson or a Pope or, or others uh, later on that they're moving more and more uh, in the direction of a, a systematic theology um, that would be not simply practical, but also philosophical and speculative, uh, certainly as we uh, get out of the uh, 18th century into the 19th and further into the 19th. Yes, so I think in some respects, I'm agreeing, uh, that there is this movement away from practical theology that you can sort of chart um, uh, you know, through subsequent Methodist theologies. That's right. There's no systematic theology, yeah. There's not going to be another Bart. Uh, yeah, I, I understand that. Um, if you conceive of theology as taking every thought captive to Christ, in other words, working out a grand synthesis in terms of uh, all of human knowledge in terms of Christ, I mean, the task is impossible, it seems, because knowledge is so vast. Um, um, and, and it's hard just to keep up in the information revolution with all that's happening. So. I mean, I think the kind of grand systematizers that we've seen in the past, um, that is going to be so difficult in, in the days ahead, I think, because of the expanse of, uh, of knowledge. Um, yes. 
Yes. Yes. This real distinction of gradually studying scholars are systemic and systematic theology. Yes. So many Christians regard John Wesley as a systematic theology. As you know, Korean theology is led by Calvinistic theology. So Wesley certain scholars cannot avoid thinking about systematic approach to John Wesley against Calvinistic. Okay, uh, you ask a very, very interesting question. Um, um, and I was in Korea not too long ago lecturing on Wesley. Um, uh, and you're talking about the strength of the Calvinist uh, church uh, in Korea, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the Wesleyan uh, church uh, as well in Korea. And then uh, what should be done? What should be done, especially in terms of this question of practical theology? I think... Um, in answer to that, Methodism has to look towards its call and mission. Uh, I think in terms of its historic call and mission. So maybe the best referent here would not be what the Calvinists are doing in their systematic theology, but rather to, to grapple very seriously with what is the purpose of Methodism, to ask that teleological question, that goal-oriented question. What's the purpose of Methodism? What's its mission? What's its call? Uh, why has Methodism been raised up by God? For what purpose? What end? What is it to do? I think we have to seriously grapple with that. And in my mind, um, I would see that uh, in terms of spreading scriptural holiness. And by scriptural holiness, I mean a very, very full orb understanding here, spreading scriptural holiness across the world, around the world, that uh, I don't see any reason today in the 21st century to, to get off that narrative, to get off that story. I think that's as relevant today in the 21st century as it was in the 18th century. And so um, I would say we have to look at our own vocation, our own call. We are called, we are called by the one who transcends us. We are called forth to get out of ourselves uh, and to be for others in Christ. And, and I think we have to take that very seriously. Yeah. Other questions, comments? Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is a little certificate of appreciation. Dr. Collins, the Frank Fazbury Society wants to give you for thank you. being one of our lecturers. Thank here. you very much. And uh, we, we give you our thanks. As he was sharing, uh, I couldn't help but, but think of uh, just two things. One was when I was a student at Asbury Seminary, Dr. Tim Smith came. And he was talking about this relationship uh, between being and doing. And uh, I've been hearing about holy. I have this grand old fear that if I tried, uh, if I tried to profess something like that, and you hear my language, I'm, I'm sharing the language. If I was going to profess something like that, there'd be just no way. I couldn't get over the fact that that would be a gift of God. All I could think of was if I want to enter into this higher thing. I am going to fail. But uh, God brought me to the place where I could start to admit this was a gift. I didn't understand a lot of things. But I want to tell you, there were some, there were seeds of immorality in my heart then because I, I had not known the cleansing. I had not known uh, the efficacy of such a gift or the power to which he spoke of. But some things got settled there that never again were a part of my 
Never again. Wow. I feel like my ministry would have been cataclysmically radical without God uh, having graciously done uh, that work in my heart. And I, I look at it under the rubric of faithful is the one who calls you, yes. who also heals. And so I want to say, even as we spoke about today, we're a society for, uh, for faith and for practice, and we're a society that, that seeks to proclaim all of the privileges that God wants to extend to us. So if there's anybody uh, that wants to trust God for that moment in your life, that opportunity is here for you. And that's the spirit mm -hmm. in which we, uh, mm -hmm. we both stand in. <coughs> I want to invite you to that. Let's close in prayer, and then we're going to, I'll say a blessing, and I have one more story. Lord, thank you for this privilege today. Thank you for the reality uh, that we, we not only have a most holy faith, still alive, as alive today as it was when Christ efficaciously living his life meritoriously for all who would be saved. And by your Holy Spirit stand. Yes. If we were to use Isaiah's language that the arm of the Lord is not shortened today so that it cannot yes. save. Yes. And so we believe this to be a lie. And yet we also have this sacred holy heritage that runs yes. right through Wilmore, Kentucky, right through our heart at the yes. Francis Asbury Society and through uh, Ken Collins Heart as an instrument. Yes. We do want to not only learn, but we want to appropriate. Yes. And so we ask that you'll be with us. Thank yes. you for hearing our prayer and being with us as we seek to live out of the fullness of Jesus Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now here's my last story. I'm from New Jersey, if you're aware of that. We were both Drew students. Ken is from New York. Uh, Ken suffers from nightmares. I don't know if you're aware of that or not, but he shared it with me at the Wesleyan Society. He said, Ron, I, I realize uh, why I have nightmares. He said, are you aware that when New Yorkers see the light at the end of the tunnel, it's New Jersey? <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I'd share that story. <laughs> anyway, I hope you get to... Uh, his books are over there. He'll sign them for I'll you. sign them. And he'll uh, sit as you fellowship around the table. Enjoy yourself. All right. Thank you. Thank you.